Hi. Today, I want to talk to you about the role technology should play in the classroom and what we in Hillsborough are doing with technology in our schools. I want to start off with asking a question, and that is, should classrooms today be the same as they were when we went to school? When I went to school about 30 years ago, students sat in rows, stared forward, listened to the teacher lecture, took notes. What about 100 years ago? 100 years ago, students sat in rows, they stared forward, they listened to the teacher lecture. Though not much has changed in the past 30, 40, even 100 years ago, nothing else in our society is the same. If we had a time machine and took somebody from 30 years ago and brought them to today, they would be utterly lost and confused. They wouldn't know what was going on until we brought them into a high school classroom and they'd walk in and go, ah, this is like it was when I went to school. At least something hasn't changed. I'd like to ask another question. Should technology play a role in our schools and in our classrooms? As the director of technology, I look at this question quite often. If our world is so different now, why are classroom structures still very similar and the same? With people having so much more technology available and ubiquitous around them, why aren't we using it more in the classrooms? Things such as wearable technologies and smartphones are more prevalent, yet we're not seeing them yet in our, in our schools. So if we as an educational institution are educating our students for jobs that don't yet exist in, um, jobs that don't yet exist in using technologies that haven't even been invented yet, why aren't we in schools? I do want to ask another question. I do want to talk about technology and fear of technology because we've had that in our society. That people tend to get scared of technology. And if we look at some quotes from the experts, one quote is students today depend on paper too much. They don't know how to write on a slate without getting chalk dust all over themselves. They don't know how to clean the slate properly. What will they do when they run out of paper? I was from the 1800s, so this fear of technology has been for many years. But let's look more recently, less than 30 years ago. Computers give students an unfair advantage. Therefore, students who use computers to analyze data and create displays will be eliminated from the science fair. I don't know any science fairs today that don't encourage, if not require, the use of computing technology to analyze data. And that was only 30 years ago. Let me ask one other question. And that is, should using technology in the classroom be fun? Should it be exciting and fun? I know when I went to school, going to the computer lab was fun. We went maybe once every two months. It was exciting. It was like, yeah, we're going to school. It's going to the computer lab. This is great. Let me ask that question differently. How many of you have a smartphone? Just by a quick show of hands. How many of you have a smartphone? Wow, nearly everybody. How many of you got up this morning, grabbed that smartphone, and said, this is awesome. I have a smartphone, and I can call and text and do all these things? <laughs> OK, two people, three people. But the majority, almost all of you, did not. Most of you, though, you did get up. You picked up that phone. And the things you did with it, that's what was exciting. That was interesting. That's what was engaging. And that's what we're starting to see in Hillsborough. So in Hillsborough, we changed the culture here where Technology use wasn't this special thing that was unique and fun. Oh, we're using computers today. Instead, we changed the culture where technology use is part of the norm. And it's ubiquitous, and it's everywhere. We implemented a program where all students in grades K through 12 have access to a digital device throughout the entire day. It doesn't mean that they're sitting in front of their computers, always typing. Um, but it does allow them access to these devices and these resources all the time. And so what have we seen as a result of that? We've seen this rise in asynchronous learning, where students are able to learn at their own pace and own time. Uh, another question for you. How many of you think learning algebra, advanced algebra, at 7.30 in the morning is the best time that, to learn algebra? <laughs> no hands that time. <laughs> However, because of Bell's schedules, when we have to get kids to and from school, so we have students who are taking algebra at that time in the morning. With the use of these digital devices now, what we're finding is that students are able to access resources all the time, 24-7. And with asynchronous learning, they're able to learn when it's appropriate to them, when it's correct time for them. We're also seeing a rise in the changes of the classrooms. No longer are we seeing this kind of 
model where students are sitting in rows listening to the teacher lecture. It happens, and it's, and it, and it's expected, and it's, it's useful, but not all the time like it was. We're seeing teachers challenging themselves and taking risks and trying new things. One of the changes for our teachers has been the teaching education was always about being the sage on the stage, the person standing in front, telling the students, this is what you need to know. I'm going to tell you everything. To being more of this guide on the side, somebody who's kind of helping students find relevant information, make connections, and understand and learn. With our new classrooms and new structures that we're starting to see, we have lots of districts wanting to come see us and start to model what we're doing here. We had one educator, an administrator, come from another district, and he was looking at one of our fifth grade classrooms, and he went over to the student and tapped him on the shoulder and said, don't you find it really odd that your back is facing the front of the room? The student thought about that for a second, and he was kind of confused and looked up at him and said, hey, that's the front of the room, pointing to where the whiteboard was. Because to him, his educational environment was always wherever he was, whoever he was working with, and whatever he was learning not necessarily facing the front of the room. We're also seeing connections happening now that can never happen before as a result of the technology. We're seeing that classes are starting to be able to collaborate with each other. Very interesting story early on in our journey was when we had two students in a science class working together. The teacher didn't know this, though. Teacher went over to them at the end of class and said, I see the two of you guys working on the same document throughout class. I'm going to give you guys detention. You guys were passing notes. You weren't paying attention. And the students got really defensive. And they said, well, but, but what do we do? We weren't doing anything. He said, you guys were you know, not paying attention. You were passing notes. Like my day, we used to pass paper notes. And so they said, no, we weren't. We, and they brought up their document. And sure enough, they were actually taking collaborative notes in class. The two of them did this on their own, organically. They thought to do this. And this has become very common in Hillsborough now, that students will open a shared document and take common notes. And it's so much better because now, instead of one, t one student taking notes and another student doing the exact same thing, the two of them together are working. And I'm taking notes on what the teacher may be writing on the board, and somebody else is taking notes on what the teacher is talking about. And together, we have a great log of what's happened in that class. This has grown so much that's become common with our staff, that when you go to department meetings, it's very common for a staff member to open up their device and share out instantly a document, put the agenda on it, and say, let's go. And everybody shared notes on that one agenda. And afterwards, you have a nice catalog of what's happened in that meeting. We're also seeing not only collaboration with our classrooms, but also between classes. We have second grade students who were posting science questions on an online blog. And then we had our seventh grade students look at those questions and record video answers and send them back to the second grade students. The second grade students loved learning from their older peers. And the older students loved and felt so empowered being the teacher. But we're not only bridging the walls between our classes and students collaborating within classes and between our schools. We're also doing it outside of our schools. In this example you see here, these were Hillsborough students working with another school district out in Pennsylvania. And one picture shows the Pennsylvania school, one picture shows the Hillsborough school. What they did for this project was they were required to partner up to stu Hillsborough students to two students from the remote school. And then they used their devices. One device was used to create a video connection. The second device was used to open a shared document. And the four students together, two Hillsborough, two of the remote school, were then solving real world problem that they were introduced to the day before in class. And this is becoming very commonplace in Hillsborough, these kind of activities. But not only is it our upper grade students doing this, we're also seeing it with our younger students. In this picture, just a couple days ago, we had a first grade class connect with another first grade class in another state. The first graders then were able to ask each other questions and talk about what first grade was like in their school and what was unique, and what was different. One little boy went home and told his mom, he said, Mom, it was so cool. We got to talk to other students, and they told us what first grade was like for them, and the different books that they read. We also are doing things called mystery hangouts. So in a mystery hangout, you don't know who you're connecting with. Well, the teacher does. So. <laughs> but the students don't know. And sometimes they do this individually, one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes as a whole class. 
And what will happen is the students will then have to ask eliminating questions to ascertain where the remote school is from. So they'll ask questions like, does it rain where you are? Are there beaches? Does it snow at all? And those type of questions help them ascertain where they're located. I've talked about all these different examples where we're now collaborating, just like in the real world, just like in the workforce. But we're also able to use the technology to go to places we've never been before. Things such as using Google Maps, we can visit remote locations, see things such as like the Great Wall of China, things that we couldn't normally have our students take part in do. They're even able to cross boundaries of time and space and visit places such as ancient Rome um, and tour through the Colosseum as it was back then. We're also connecting with experts from around the world. Numerous times, we've brought in experts to talk to our students. Some examples include former First Lady Barbara Bush, scientists at the South Pole, numerous authors of books that the students have read, dairy farmers. The list goes on and on. So as a result of technology, what are we seeing? Because of the technology, students are able to have more personalized and targeted education. Teachers are seeing engagement levels in our students rise. Classrooms are becoming more paperless. And resources are available 24-7 for the students to learn from. We're starting to see organizational skills. We all know the story. Student walks into the classroom. Papers always falling out of their binder. They can't find their homework from last night. The dog ate the homework. They don't even have a dog. Now that everything's available digitally and accessible 24-7, organization, stu students are able to be much more organized. And we're seeing gains, especially in some of our lowest achieving students because of that. When we surveyed teachers, teachers told us they feel the students are more organized. They feel they're better able to individualize the curriculum and align it to various standards and goals. When we asked parents, parents, the majority of parents said they felt their students were more connected outside of school with their peers as a result of having their devices. And when we asked students, the most important members of our community, what they felt, 70% believe they learn better by having the device. 75% believe they're more connected with their peers now than before they had devices. And 80% believe they're more organized. As a result of all this technology that we're introducing in our schools and the innovative and creative ways teachers and students are pushing the envelope on traditional teaching and learning models, we're starting to see amazing things happen. And I'm so interested in seeing what the future looks like. This classroom that you see here reminds me more of a startup culture where people are engaged in creative ideas than it is traditional classrooms. Thank you.